right, guys, we're going to get started. I think we have everyone taken care of. There's still a few in the lobby waiting for coffee. And uh, so grab your booklet. If you do not have a booklet, let us know. We want to make sure everyone has a booklet in hand. Mike Holly has those. He's going to distribute those if needed. And then also everyone should have, based on the uh, suggestion from my wife, you have message notes for tonight's teaching to help... <laughs> Notice that's the only table. Oh, now everybody celebrates. Okay. Everybody's like, I had no idea where you were last week. I'm like, was it that hard to follow? So y'all just spoiled. That's what it is. Y'all spoiled. I've spoiled y'all because I give you message notes and scriptures and you have everything you need. That's what it is. We take care of our people. So thank y'all. Thank y'all for being here for the beta Satan and uh, last week, if you happen to miss it, I'll, I'll let the secret out. It, the teaching is on YouTube. If you want to go to our YouTube channel, you can actually catch it. And, um, and so if you missed last week, you can go back and watch it. If you do not have the actual book, Bait of Satan, we have those in the cafe. I'd encourage you to read the book. It goes along with a lot of the teaching. Um, this curriculum, John Bevere wrote the book. John Bevere is the author of the actual book and the study, The Bait of Satan. And uh, usually there's a video that we teach with him teaching it. I got permission from him personally to be able to teach his content uh, because I really wanted to personalize it more this year. We do this once a year. And um, our, our Wednesday nights are our midweek discipleship nights. And, um, and so I'm loving midweek. I don't know if you guys, I love this. I love this format. And, um, and so we're contemplating the next study we do, whether we're gonna do a book study uh, we know we're going to do maybe a book study on uh, one of the books of the Bible, maybe Hebrews or Romans. We're kind of debating on that. And, um, and so we're doing that. And we're also looking at maybe doing a financial study, maybe a three to four weeks on finances. And, um, and so uh, it may be or may not be Dave Ramsey. I fail at Dave Ramsey. I mean, I can't even succeed with Dave. I don't know. That's just challenging for all of us. But um, so thank you all for being here. I, I promise you, you will grow in your faith if you designate this time on Wednesdays to, to come and be a part of these events. And, um, and so thank you guys so much. And we wanna make sure everyone has a table, a seat. If we need to add tables and chairs, we will. And uh, so before I get started, those of you that are, are aware, um, I have been extremely busy this week along with our staff. We have been helping coordinate disaster relief for Moss Point. And uh, I want you guys to know where we are because there's still a need. We have co coordinated just in the last couple of days, Convoy of Hope, uh, we are a partner with Convoy of Hope. You guys know y'all help support Convoy of Hope through your missions giving. And, um, and so we have them coming in. They're on their way. They actually, they're going to be on site. Um, they're staying in uh, one of the truck stops in Moss Point up on 63. They're going to be on site at 8 a.m. in the morning. And we're having people to meet here on campus. Anyone that's available to serve tomorrow, volunteer. Uh, what Convoy does is there's a whole tractor trailer load of supplies and uh, what we're gonna be doing is we're gonna be putting those, unloading the truck tomorrow morning at 8 a.m. Gonna meet here first and then we got release of liabilities and those things they've requested for us to do. And then we're gonna take teams over to serve. And, and even if you have smaller children, as long as you supervise them, they're able to serve in the capacity because we've got a lot of stuff to put together. There's gonna be buckets and cleaning supplies and all kinds of stuff that they put in these buckets. And so people will just drive around and we will put them in their cars and then they'll go on their way. Red Cross is gonna be set up right next door uh, to where we're gonna be. So there's gonna be one line for all the supplies. So if you know anyone that needs supplies, please, please, please. And, and I just thank you, Collective Family. Y'all make this possible. This is why we support missions. This is why we're part of organizations. And so thank y'all. And uh, very, very thankful to have the relationship that we have, not only with Convoy of Hope. Convoy, of course, is the big one that's coming in. Uh, but we also have uh, Mercy Chefs on site. Joel Colley, been, been friends with Joel for, for 15 years, uh, pastored a church in Paducah, Kentucky. We actually helped plant that church, still going strong in Paducah. Uh, Joel is one of the leaders for Mercy Chefs, and he's there now. They're actually serving food. They're at the first Baptist parking lot, I believe. And uh, but the location tomorrow is going to be on the news as well as on the Facebook pages. It's going to be um, there near City Hall. So if you need to tell someone, there's going to be signs, sheriff's deputies, and all is going to be helping coordinate. And uh, so please, 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 there's going to be hot meals. There's already hot meals being served. Uh, there's plenty of water, plenty. No one, as of right now, even the mayor, we talked to the mayor yesterday, no one... This has been amazing because the church has really stepped up and there's no one with me. Randy, where are you at, Randy? Where's Randy? Randy, and so I talked to Randy yesterday morning 
And, and you guys, Usher team, he serves. Can I use you as an example just for a moment, Randy? I mean, I know you're not completely put back together, but, but Randy's roof got blown off his house. He was without supplies. He was, a, I mean, there's a lot of things that he needed. And before evening last night, he was taken care of by the team that he serves on here at Collective and has everything that he needs. And so thank y'all for that. Because here's the thing, we're going to take care of our people, y'all. <laughs> we're going to, right? And I love seeing the church take care of the church. And so uh, we're, we're partnering with, I can't tell you who all I've talked to. I mean, I've talked to just about everybody in South Mississippi, I think the last couple of days. Um, and so Mayor Billy, man, he's doing an amazing job in Moss Point. So y'all, I'm just telling you, the leadership in Moss Point has been amazing. I'm, I'm just really blown away. I took the guys yesterday, staff guys, and we rode around and and just kind of looked and just about everywhere we went, there were people serving, removing trees, getting, so, so it's, it's, it's awesome. But we kind of, unfortunately, we know what it's like, don't we, Gulf Coast? We know what it's like in these tragedies. And so thank y'all. If you can serve tomorrow, if you can volunteer, if you know anybody, they do not have to be a part of this church. Uh, we've got three other churches that are sending people tomorrow that's gonna be here, Church of the King, uh, which we're in a relationship with anyway. Pastor Steve's a friend of mine over in Mandeville. And so their Gulf Coast campus in Biloxi, they're sending some people. Mosaic is sending some people over. Um, and then also we have uh, Cedar Lake, I think, is sending some people. And I think that's all. That's the only churches I've heard from personally. And, um, and so, so, yeah, we're going we're gonna to do what we can to take care of our, our family in Moss Point, guys. And so that's what we do. So anyway, so thank you. And thank you for your missions giving because all the monies that you give for disaster relief, it's going to the disaster relief effort. And, um, and so I love it when the mayor says, hey, there's no need. We have everything we need because the church is making it happen. So that is amazing. If you are a part of the collective family and you have a need, we need to know it. I mean, if you don't tell us, we don't know. We, we don't just know. I mean, I know everybody thinks we sit around reading everybody's Facebook. We don't do that. We, if you're on a team, make sure your team lead knows if you have a need. It's kind of like if you're in the hospital, let us know. Tell everybody at your table, let them know. Because if, we, if you don't tell your team lead, we don't know. And we do have a pastoral care team that does visitations. And I just feel like I need to say that right now because guys, you know, the church is much bigger than one or two people. It's all of us. And so, and I'm very excited to be a part of a family of faith that cares and supports. And um, man, it's just, it's great to be in the kingdom in these days. Amen. If you want to continue to support financially, you can give. Uh, that's online. And again, I encourage you to do that as well. And we make sure all the efforts go to those that are in need. Are y'all ready for some bait of Satan? Now you don't beta Satan. You want the teaching for beta Satan. I mean, nobody wants the beta Satan. All right, um, you do have message notes there, so grab those. Grab your Bibles, and so you, so you are. Let me go ahead and make the disclaimer that I didn't last week. So in your booklet that you have, there's there's different parts for it. Some will be table talk at the end of tonight's teaching, and the rest is homework. Now let me say that those of you that have been in my class before, you need to do the homework. So let me ask a question and let me get offended real quick. Jerry Tomes is already trying to offend me tonight and Janet and a few others. Y'all pray for coach. I don't get offended. Ask my wife. I don't have feelings. I mean, I really, I don't know if that's something to brag about. I mean, I really don't, I don't get offended. I mean, it's like, whatever. I mean, you have the problem, not me. Anyway, so there's homework. How many of you actually did the homework? Raise your hand because you get a purple star. Y'all get lattes. How many did not do their homework? Raise your hand. Yeah, y'all the people that almost flunked out of high school too, didn't you? <laughs> do the homework. It's not gonna take you all week. Do the homework. So anyway, with that being said, do the homework. You, you got books, do it. I really, I really do want to encourage you. And, and here's the reason why, and I said this last week, this is probably the, one of the biggest toxins in the church today in America is offense. I mean, it is because we're offended about everything as a nation and as goes the church, as goes our nation, whether you know that or not. 
And so um, I'm gonna talk a little bit, we're gonna talk about Joseph tonight, but I encourage you, do the work, put the work in. You will get out of this what you put into it. It's like freedom, when we went through the freedom course, uh, you will get out of it what you put into it. And so if you really wanna be free from offense, put the work in, it's worth it. In order to be a disciple, you've gotta be a disciplined one. I think all of us probably are, are having aspirations to be a disciple. You're not gonna just wake up one day and be a disciple. It's like you don't wake up one day and are the star quarterback of the team. There's work that goes into it. And so I just really, really wanna encourage you to lean in, do the work, do the homework. We provided everything for you. And so I hope and pray that we will have an offense-free church by the end of this year. I will be a much better pastor, I promise you, if we can get rid of offense. The staff know this, the team leads know this, because this is, I've seen it so much, especially lately, that it's, it's almost like the devil doesn't really have to do anything other than just get us offended. Because if he gets us offended, then guess what? We get isolated, insulated, bitter, and then we're just, you know, and then we're just wounded. And the wound isn't, sometimes it's not even substantiated. It's just we took offense to something that really wasn't intended to be offensive. And so I want us to, I want us to grow. Let me pray, and then we're going to jump right into the teaching tonight. So let's pray together. Father, in the name of Jesus, thank you. Thank you for this moment, for this night, for these people. And Lord, I just thank you, first of all, for your church rising up, Lord, for those in need. I thank you, Lord, that we have a generous church. This is a generous church family that's serving, uh, that's giving, that's doing whatever it takes to support and to help those in need. So Lord, I thank you for that. I thank you, I thank you that we're a part of a life-giving movement. And Lord, I thank you for this teaching. I thank you tonight that your spirit's going to lead us, guide us, speak to us as we study. Uh, Lord, not just tonight, but over the course of the next few weeks, because Lord, we do want to grow in our faith. We want to grow in our walk. We want to become more like you. And so we just ask you to lead us and guide us, direct us in Jesus' name we pray, amen. All right, so let's jump right in. If you have your Bibles, Genesis 37 is where we're going to be. So there will be some reference points to Genesis 37. Those of you that are familiar with Joseph and Joseph's dreams, and we're going to kind of do an overview of that. And so I want to encourage you to read Genesis 37 and study that between now and next week as well. Uh, but in this lesson, we're going to talk about two, we're going to talk about one, but let me give you the two points. First of all, we're talking about two categories of Christians who are offended. And the first one is this, is those who have been genuinely mistreated. Let me say it again. Those who have been genuinely mistreated. That's category one. And then category two is those who think they have been mistreated. So those who have genuinely been mistreated and those who think they have been mistreated. We're not gonna talk about the second tonight. We're gonna to talk about those who have genuinely have been mistreated um, because a lot of times those who think they've been mistreated either have um, inaccurate information sometimes and sometimes uh, we need to go, go a little deeper and we will by session four talking about those that are in that second category, just, just so you know. So we're gonna talk about Joseph tonight. How many of you ever studied about Joseph? How many of you remember, you've heard of Joseph? Some of you have, many of you haven't. We have, um, that's what's interesting. One of the things that we study in our children's ministries is we talk about Joseph and his coat of many colors. I'm gonna kind of highlight that. Genesis 37 is where you can find most of the context. We're gonna review his life. First of all, he was the grandson of Abraham. How many know Father Abraham? You've heard that. Maybe you've been in Sunday school before. Maybe as a kid, that song just came to mind, didn't it, Pastor Jeff? Is that what you were singing? Father Abraham? Yes, yes I know you. And so anyhow, uh, when, jo when Joseph shows up on the scene, he's a bit of a tattletale. And so you've got to look at Joseph and who Joseph, and if you study it, it's really, really interesting because you might be a little frustrated with Joseph too, especially if you were his older brothers. We'll talk about that. He's got some character issues. How many of you think you might have some care? How many know some people in this room with character issues? How many think it might be you? I'm just seeing how many hands went down when I, when I asked that question. So he was a bit of a bragger. Joseph bragged a little bit. And one night, let me just kind of highlight for you. Um, his dad actually favored him. And so he goes to sleep one night and he has this dream that his brothers are going to bow down to him. Now, it's one thing to have the dream. It's another thing to go tell your brothers, right? <laughs> I had this dream and I, you're going, I'm going to lord over you. I'm going to rule you. So, so anyway, so, <laughs> so he does that, which makes them hate him any, even more. 
they already hated him because he was dad's favorite. How many of you know that there's always a favorite child? How many of you have multiple kids? Okay, keep your hands up. Do you have a favorite child? If you do, keep your hand up. Be honest. See, y'all lie, y'all lie, you lie. I don't care. I don't care. You have... I do, don't act all saintly because you do have a favorite. I've never met anyone that, let me just go back. I got one child. I can say it. I have a favorite. He's my only one. So anyway, so his father favors him. And so once he tells them, hey, this dream, they are out for blood. They are like, okay, this guy got to go, right? And so anyway, so Jacob, he sends his 10 older sons to watch the flocks of a distant away. And he sends Joseph to actually go check on them. And if you read in Genesis 37, you can see all this. And he's, there, he's approaching them, Joseph is, and they see him coming. And so they start plotting a plan. They're like, okay, so here he comes. Uh, let's kill him. <laughs> read Genesis 37. It's really cool. Let's just take this guy out and, um, and see what becomes of his dream then, right? I mean, you know, he has this dream. Let's just take him out see if he'll ever rule over us. So they grab him, they tear off his robe, they throw him into a pit, and they put blood on the robe. And they're planning to tell the father that he's dead, all right? So they're gonna leave him to die, but then they see some Ishmaelites coming, and so they decided, you know what, instead of doing that, why don't we just trade him off and get some money or something, you know? Why don't, why don't we profit from this? And so, and we'll tell dad he's dead, and so sure enough, he'll think he's dead anyway. He's gone, he's out of here, nobody will ever know, and we've made some money. So anyway, they sold him off as a slave, and um, anyway, so they, agree, they agreed to get 20 pieces of silver for Joseph. So Joseph's taken down to Egypt. And again, you can read all this in Genesis 37. And you got to think about how big of a blow this had to be for Joseph. Because with this guy, we as Americans, we don't always understand what they did to their brother. Because in America, I think we a lot of times don't understand reality in a lot of the world because we've got it so good. Thank God that we, we do have it as good as we do. Sometimes it's too good, especially when it comes to prisons, and we'll talk about that here in just a few minutes. So it's one thing if you're born a slave because it's the only life that they would have known, right? And so it's another thing to um, entirely to be born as an, an heir, a wealthy man that has a covenant with God and then to have your name and inheritance completely stripped away from you, which is what happened to Joseph because he was sold as a slave by his brothers. Um, and the thing about your brothers to me, you talk about being betrayed. I mean, your brothers are supposed to have your back, right? I mean, you're supposed to, supposed to. But the brothers were highly offended. They were mad. Now, Joseph was a little braggadocious. And so there's probably some merit to some of their frustration, I mean, if you put yourself in their sandals, you can kind of see that a little differently. And so in those days when you were a foreigner sold as a slave, it meant you'd be a slave for the rest of your life. And so this wasn't like a three-day sentence at the ADC, okay? And so your spouse, your children would all become slaves as well. So natives in most places um, have never experienced what we have here in America because they didn't know, they didn't, and there wasn't, there wasn't flat screen TVs and they're still not today. There's not as much amenity, amenities in these prisons in other countries as we have in America. Sometimes I think we treat prisoners better. I'm in law enforcement, I can say it. I've been behind, I've been, listen, I've been in, the, if Nathan Children was here, he served in a federal prison. He'll tell you for three years. He was in, he's like, you know, it was Nathan, just so y'all know, Nathan is our student pastor. We hired a fugitive. If you know the story, we've been knowing Nathan a long time, but anyway, we trust him and we have an ankle bracelet. I'm just kidding, I'm kidding, I'm kidding. So anyway, no, we, <laughs> he does a great job leading his team. So this third world country, when it comes to prisons, they don't have everything like we have. And so when you think about where Joseph was, they did the absolute worst thing they could do to Joseph besides kill him because he had all this inheritance. He had all of this stuff going his way. And so he's brought down to Egypt. He's sold uh, as a slave to Potiphar, which is an officer of Pharaoh. And Joseph serves him for 10 years. Everybody say 10 years. 
So during this decade, he's probably hoping that his brothers maybe fess up to dad. Hey, you know what? This is what we did. Um, but they didn't. That didn't happen. So he's serving for 10 years. And so there's a tough 10 years. And, and it's a, kind of a long time to really be in a prison like they have over there. In the middle of all this, he's doing well because God is blessing him even when he's in the prison, which is interesting. And so he's gaining favor with Potiphar, who eventually puts him over all of the affairs of his house. Interesting. But then something worse happens. Potiphar's wife gets the hots for him. Listen, your Bible is a very interesting documentation of events that occurred. You really ought to read it sometime. There's some really good stuff. So she tries to seduce him. And it wasn't just like one time or two. I mean, it's like constant. She's, she's after him. And every day, Scripture says, she says, sleep with me. My husband will never know. I'm filtering what I'm saying. And you know what he does? He says, I love his fear of God, by the way, because he says, no, I'm not sinning against God and I'm not sinning against your husband. Now, 10 years, he's been locked up. Some of y'all, 10 days, it's like, you know what? (laughs) Can we be honest at Collective Church? <laughs> Somebody's like, Genesis, what? <laughs> Let me go back and read it. <laughs> if you really want to get good, get to the Song of Solomon. That's really, and there's, there's a lot of symbolism and literal there. We may do a, we may do a book study on song. Uh, Tony says, no, don't. Why not? We could, we could, rump, we could, okay, Tony says, stop. You're not going to be here next week. Pastor Jeff will, so I might need to let Pastor Jeff teach next week. My wife won't be in the room. I'm just telling the truth, just talking about the word. So anyway, let's get going. So, so he says, no, we're not doing this. I'm not sitting against God. Not sitting. So one day he's in there and she grabs his coat and she pulls his coat off because the girl was desperate. And so he takes off running and (laughs) there's, first of all, there's a moral to the story. Gentlemen, do not be by yourself with a woman, not your wife. Can I teach that? Stay away. Do not. Some of y'all like, no, 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 no. Because it doesn't, you know, here's the thing. There's this thing called social media. Whether it's true or not, somebody going to say it. And optics is everything. Ask me how I know. Not because of that, but because of politics. That's what I feel about that August 8th, please, for the love of Jesus. I'm going to rest well that night, even if I lose, especially if I lose. And so anyway, so he says, I'm not sitting against God. And the Bible says that he actually flees the sexual immorality. And so his robe's torn, he's naked, she's a scorned woman. So here's what she says. She starts crying rape. Genesis 37, guys, just so you know. So Potiphar comes home and she tells him that he tried to rape her. Here's an inmate, right? Who's he going to believe? And Potiphar throws him into Pharaoh's dungeon. But to fully appreciate the situation, you got to understand something else. Our prisons, like I said a little while ago, are like country clubs compared to where he was. Middle Eastern dungeons were usually hollowed out cisterns actually deep in the ground where there was no fresh air. It was damp, cold, dark, and some of the ceilings were even very low. Psalm 105 says this, they laid his feet in irons and they hurt him in fetters. I want you to just think about that. Again, this is, this is not the ADC. So this is anything but a country club. So let's talk about his thoughts about Potiphar. If you're Joseph, we've got to think about this. Because if I was Joseph and this happened to me, first of all, I got some stuff about your wife we need to talk about. Don't matter. He ain't going to believe it, right? But he's been so faithful to Potiphar. And if I was Joseph, I'd be like, hey, I've been more faithful to you than your wife, brother. I've done this. I've done that. And this is the treatment. 
that I get? You're going to throw me in this prison? And so think about what he's saying to God, man. Think about what Joseph had. Again, we got to put ourselves into the story. He hadn't done anything wrong. Remember, he did nothing wrong even to get there in the first place. He shared the dream that God gave him with his brothers. And now he's in slavery. And so if he's talking to God, he's probably saying, God, I've been obeying you. I've been faithful. I've done this. I go to church. I serve on the serve team. You know, I tithe. I'm going to help with the distribution for convoy tomorrow. I do all this stuff, you know, and, and, and here I am. How could life get worse when you see where Joseph was? Again, he's a foreigner. He's not an Egyptian. Okay. If he were an Egyptian, he might have a chance of getting out. But when you're a foreigner, a slave that's accused of raping an officer's uh, wife, they're leaving you there to rot. You ain't getting out. So, so he's got all this time to think. And he's thinking about God and he's thinking about this covenant keeper. Because remember, he's Abraham's grandson, right? So you think about this and he's lost all of his freedom. And he's lost the freedom of the way he thinks, the way he processes life. He has a great chance to have some strongholds built because of this huge offense that he has had to over, undergo and, and deal with. He's been lied on. He's been betrayed. He's being persecuted. He's in a prison. He's, and he has done nothing. He's legitimately innocent. So here's the thing. If his brothers wouldn't have done what they did, he would have enjoyed 10 years of his father's wealthy estate. How many times do people fall in this kind of thinking? If it wasn't for my wife, I'd be a much better man today. But she constantly criticizes and nags. If it wasn't for my husband, if it wasn't for my pastor, I'd be in the ministry today. Which is interesting. If it wasn't for the man who gossiped about me, I wouldn't have been fired from my job. Here's the truth we've got to understand. No man, woman, child, or devil can ever get you out of the will of God for your life. And we as people of faith have got to understand that. I'm going to preach on this a little bit more on Sunday, by the way. Not Joseph, but something in context very similar. God holds our destiny. We're not here to suck air and die. There's something God wants us to do, right? So if you get the truth that you're a free person, and that God is for you and not against you. I want you to look at the words in Genesis 37, 20. Look at, look at the words of Joseph's brothers. It says, come therefore, let us kill him and cast him into a pit. Look at what he says. We shall see what becomes of his dreams then. So here, and I think I put this on your notes. They intended to destroy any chance of him ever becoming a leader. Because he had told them, I'm going to be a leader. I'm going to rule over you. First of all, character issues probably shouldn't have done it. Joseph could have sat there and stewed in bitter thoughts and plots to re, to, for revenge against his brothers. How many of y'all would? You about you, when I get out of here, come Oh, we got some halos in the room. Everybody, just polish that little baby real quick. Y'all sit there. No, y'all know somebody done messed you up, said something on Facebook. You just wait till I see them. You wait till I see them in Rouse's. You wait till I see them at Convoy tomorrow. We're going to have a conversation. They're going to be going back to Missouri. Anyway. So he could have been saying all this stuff. He could be thinking, I'm going to kill him. And if he had chosen that path, God would have had to leave him in that dungeon to rot because he would have killed 10 of the 12 tribes of Israel, including Judah. So stop and think for a minute. Do you think when his brothers did this, that God, the father looked over at Jesus and the Holy Spirit and says, what are we going to do now? They have just messed up our plan. What are we going to do? Jesus, do you have an alternate plan here? I don't, I, don't know what's, I don't know what's happening. Like this is happening and we didn't plan this. What's plan B, C, or D? Um, or it could be something very similar. Jesus, Ruth, she's 34. She's single. Her best friend gossiped about her. So the man that she wanted to marry now won't marry her. What in the world's going to happen now? Everything's ruined. Or maybe it's... A coworker that gossiped about somebody and they didn't get a promotion or they lost their job. Do you think God's up there going, oh no, there's nothing we can do. Things are over for him. Things are over for her. That's crazy, right? But don't we think that way? 
something goes wrong, something doesn't go the way we expect it to. We talked about expectations last week, and it's like, man, my whole life is ruined because somebody said something on Facebook, because somebody did something or did this. We do it. We do it as if God gets blindsided by the wrong things that happen in the world. Where's our faith? Is it in humanity or is it in God, the author and the finisher of our faith? So he's in this dungeon. We really don't know how long. It could have been a month. It could have been longer. Um, God brings the greatest test to, to Joseph, and this is the test. Here, there's two prisoners, Pharaoh's chief butler and chief baker. So there's a butler and a baker. They're thrown in the same dungeon. And one day they come to Joseph, each with a dream to be interpreted, which is kind of interesting, isn't it? So they're in this prison. They have dreams. They want the interpretation of the dream. They just happen to be there with Joseph. I mean, totally, totally coincidence. So now Joseph is faced with a choice. Does he pass on the bitterness of his own crushed dream? Or does he proclaim the faithfulness of God to this butler and baker when he hasn't seen one shred of God's faithfulness in his own life for 10 years? Now, God gave him a dream that he'd be a leader and that his brothers would bow down and serve him. And here he is, having gone from pit to slavery to dungeon, left there to rot. Certainly looks like God hasn't been faithful. Can he really stand there and declare the goodness of God after all of that? I want us to stop and process that in our own lives for a moment. 10 years. He hasn't experienced the favor of God that he thinks. So what does he do? He's got the opportunity now. He's the dream interpreter. And so I would have to think that if this happened today, and this, this was you or me, I can just speak for me. You got a dream? Good for you. Go have fun with that. Because 10 years, y'all, some of us, 10 days, and it's like, yeah, uh-uh. 10 years, let's think about it. Joseph's fear of God was so amazing. And when you read this, it's just amazing because he looks at the butler and he looks at the baker and he says this. He says, God is faithful. I want you to say that. I want you to say, God is faithful. And then he proceeds to give them the interpretation of the dreams that the Holy Spirit gave him for them. The baker is beheaded and the butler is restored to his position three days later, which is exactly what he said would happen. Before the butler goes back to the palace, Joseph says, hey, when you're back in the palace, would you please remember me? Would you please like tell Potiphar or Pharaoh, would you remember this? But he forgets. I mean, the guy can't do anything right. I mean, he's, he's been faithful. So the guy goes back and he forgets Joseph. Two more years, Joseph is stuck. Come on, y'all, y'all know y'all done got bitter. Y'all, some of y'all bitter, and you're just trying to feel Joseph's pain, right? Joseph didn't have the book of Genesis to read to know what come, come next. So he has no idea what's going to happen. Think about how long two years is to be in a dungeon with just a little bit of bread to survive. David, you don't need to be leaving. This is the best part of teaching. You get up every time I get to the best part. I'm trying to offend you right Get your tail back in here. <laughs> Pastor Jeff, you need to get a hold of your people. We'll wait on David. Anybody else need to get up and go? We'll wait on you too. I'm, just I'm, trying to, I'm trying to offend people so we can expose it, so we can just go ahead and deal with it. So two years later, Pharaoh has a dream. The butler hears about it. And he says, oh no. I, I've sinned. I totally forgot. There's this man in prison who interpreted this dream. And Pharaoh again sends him and says, hey, go get this guy. And so... Here's what Joseph goes and tells Pharaoh. He says, look, there's going to be seven years of plenty and then seven years of drought and famine. Store up now so you'll be ready. There's some spiritual principle to that, by the way. And then Joseph is made the prime minister, which is second in command of all of Egypt, the most powerful nation in the world at the time. Now, after two years of famine, nine years after he was pulled out of slavery and 21 years since he had the dream of becoming a leader and his brothers show up out of nowhere, what does he do? He blesses them and he gives them their money back. Look at what the brother says in Genesis 45. He says, but now do not therefore be grieved or angry with yourselves because you sold me here. 
For God sent me before you to preserve life, to preserve a posterity for you in the earth and to save your lives by a great deliverance. So now it's not you who sent me here, but that's huge, y'all. Psalm 105 says, Moreover, God called for famine in the land. He destroyed all the provisions of bread. God sent a man before them, Joseph, who was sold as a slave. It was not his brothers, Joseph said, that sent me here. It was God. Remember what I said earlier? When I said no man, woman, child, or devil can ever get you out of the will of God? Nobody can. But here's the kicker. You can. You can. You and you alone no one can take you out of the will of God. No one can remove you and your decision and your response. You are the only one that has that authority. So let's talk about that for a moment. So God told the children of Israel, you're about to enter the land. I promised I'm giving this to you. They got offended. We see offense all through the scripture. They thought they were offended with Moses, but they were really offended with God. If you get this revelation, here's the thing. The only one who can get you out of the will of God is you when you take the bait of offense. The bait of offense is what will rob you. It'll steal. It'll kill your dreams, your purpose, your destiny, your relationships every single time. And no one can do it. Only you if you allow it. God wrote a book about you before you were born. David said in Psalm 139, you saw me before I was born. Every day of my life was recorded in your book. Now that, that gets interesting to me theologically. You know, I want to like every day of my life. What is this? And again, we'll talk about that a little more as the study continues. Psalm 37 says, the Lord directs the steps of the godly. He delights in every detail of their lives. Do we believe that? Do we really believe that God, do we believe, let me, let me make it personal. I thank God that no one was killed in the tornado Monday. Do we think that that tornado is bigger than God's favor? I'm not undermining or belittling. Randy lost his home, mostly. There's people that lost their homes. But do we think that it's like, oh, God forgot about? God didn't send the tornado, but out of the ruins, God can send relief and revival and blessing and favor if we respond correctly. Here's the thing, it's all, church, we've got to understand, we keep blaming everybody else for our issues, and listen, that's tests that we have been having to take. We get offended about, I wish they would do this, and I wish, we get offended about everything. People get offended about the music we, we play sometimes. I'm sorry, we're not worshiping you. We're not perfect, but we're just like you, trying to grow with Jesus, man, and lead you. We get offended with our spouse and our kids, and it's toxic. If you think about yourself and how often maybe you get offended, it's the little bitty offenses that lead to bigger offenses. Well, I can't do this. I, I remember talking about Jeff's dad, man. I, I'll never forget when Tony and I were, I mean, I've, listen, I have the privilege every single day to be offended. Notice I said privilege because I've learned to look at it as a privilege because when I'm not offended, you know what? I'm gonna get stronger from this. And also, it helps me to know who I need to set boundaries with. Praise the Lord. Why? Because everybody ain't your friend that says they're your friend. Not everybody that says they're for you is for you. You are the one that have to, you're the one that controls the gate. And we allow offense to pick us up and remove us from places of purpose. Because sometimes it's going through those difficult Seasons and those times that God is trying to do something in our lives. He's trying to develop us. He's trying to shape us. He's trying, he's preparing you. Look at Joseph, 21 years, 21. I, I, I'm gonna tell you right now, if this been me, <laughs> I'd have been trying to pick at lock. I'd be trying to blow up some walls. I'd be doing something because God done forgot about me. Listen, Kevin, I know I'd have had my Glock. I'd be shooting people. I'm just saying. I just, I don't know that I'd have the faith like Joseph. Can we all be honest? Y'all wouldn't either. Oh, but pastor, I would. Yeah, and you're, tr you lie. 
God knows we live in an evil world where people make mistakes and even sin. And Joseph's brother sinned against him. He doesn't cause those people to treat us evil, but he knows what they would do before they even do it. So he uses what they do to bring forth his plan. I imagine it never crossed Joseph's mind until everything was over, that all he went through was God's process for him to rule. For him to rule. Before he went through the years of waiting, he was a tattletale and a bragger. The first thing you hear about Joseph is him telling on his brothers. And then he has the dream. The first words out of his mouth was, hey guys, I'm gonna be your leader. <laughs> Stupidest thing to say to older brothers, right? Didn't have a lot of wisdom. He shared his dream with his brothers when he should have just kept it to himself. There's a story there too, y'all. Because God gives you a dream and a purpose for your life, it doesn't mean you need to go out on Facebook and try to tell everybody to get validation from everybody when God's only spoken it to you. Somebody got offended. Somebody needs to repent. Everything God shows you isn't for you to be the mouthpiece for the church. Sometimes God's trying to show you things for you. God can't use you with others until he can trust you with what he shows you personally. Whoa, that'll preach. And we wonder why we don't have platforms and lights. I hate all this. I don't like all the light. My team knows, I hate it, man. I like just to, let's have a talk. We did all this just because COVID happened and we had to go online. And y'all know we did some of this stuff. I ain't trying to get my name on a billboard. We ain't trying to start a university. We ain't trying to do all that. We're trying to lead people to Jesus. We're trying to help people become who God's called them to be. And honestly, we got to get out of the rut if we ever want to walk in the riches. And that's decisions that we make. We have to make the decision. I'm not going to let anything come in the way. I don't know the timing. I don't know the purpose, but I know my God and I know he's faithful and I know he's just. And guys, when you live that way, nothing can move you. We're so easily moved today, aren't we? Decades later, he goes through this refining process. When he has the chance, he doesn't reveal himself right away to his brothers. Can you imagine how he would have handled it before? <laughs> if he had not gone through this refining process, can you imagine how he may have handled it before? Hey guys, it's me. I told you my dream was gonna come to pass now. Bow. <laughs> he doesn't do that. He stays humble and he just wants to bless them. Not once does he say, I'm the boss and the buck stops here. Not once. He points out how God did this for the sake of their family. This is the one piece of evidence that he's no longer offended. Because with offended people, it's all about me. How badly I've been treated. How tough life has been to me. Poor old me. The refining processes are important because they prepare us and they give us character. And many times the way we're refined, listen to me, is through offense. Peter says, in this you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while, if need be, <laughs> if need be. In other words, if you need to be refined. Joseph needed to be refined because he didn't have the character when he was a teenager. If need be, you have been grieved, distressed by various trials, that the genuineness of your faith be much more precious than gold that perishes, though it, your faith is tested or refined by fire, may be found to the praise, honor, and glory of Jesus Christ, your Savior. Going back to Joseph, the abuse and the betrayal of his brothers ended up being the pathway to his destiny. I want you to see this. Often, the thing that looks like an abortion of God's plan actually ends up being the road to its fulfillment. If, if this is a huge if, everybody say if. if. If we stay in obedience and free from offense. Next time you think you're going through hell, remember Joseph. Remember what he endured. Remember what he overcame. Remember the promotion that he got. I've always been intrigued by Joseph and this because honestly, I have no idea how I would have. I know how I'd handled it. It wouldn't have been like Joseph. I'm just not there yet. <laughs> but I tell you where I am now that I wasn't years ago. I'm at a place now to where I don't have to have all the answers. 
I don't have to try to understand everybody's whys and hows and what's. No, no. My faith and my confidence is, you know what? God's got this. I have responsibilities. I can't just sit around and, and pr- okay, I'm about, can, I, can I just, one minute, can I vent something? Tornado hit Moss Point. I see a lot of Christians, let's just pray. No, no, don't pray. Get your butt up and start doing something. Faith without works is dead or useless. I'm not saying everybody. I'm not saying people got, I get that. I've seen, we had a pastor, not gonna say anything, not gonna say, not gonna say who, wanted to know the theology of the groups that we were bringing in before they allowed them to even come near their, their site. Am I right, Tony? I'm sitting there last night and I'm talking to somebody about this, I'm talking to Wayne, Lena, and I said, tell them that they're coming to preach the doctrine of Satan. Because y'all know me. I'm like, yeah, that's some of the stupidest mess I've heard. They're coming to feed people. Why? Because people don't have food in homes. I said, tell that preacher to call me. I can't stand preachers. <laughs> and of course, Wayne and I had some laughs. And I tell you why. It's because guys were so easily offended by anything that looks different than us, thinks different than us, operates different than us, but it's the differences than us that's shaping our character to the purpose that he's called. Allow the process to work. Allow the shaping to mold. Take thoughts captive. It is impossible that offenses should not come. It's going to come. It's going to happen. But look at them as opportunities, not judgments. Look at them as opportunities. Think about Joseph. Man, I'm inspired by this. I'm inspired by Joseph and wow, two decades, two decades. And I get offended because somebody don't text me back in two minutes. I mean, not me, I don't care. But y'all get the point. And so we're so offended today. And it goes back to last week. Then I'm going to turn you over to Table Talk. We expect, right? We expect. See the bubbles. Oh, then they go away. We expect. Knock, knock. The staff know because I'll send like a knock. Did you get that? Because I saw the red receipt. You better respond but we experience. And the ever how close we are to the person, the higher we expect of them, which makes it the easier we're offended when we don't experience the expectation. Spouse, children, pastors, come on somebody. But what would happen if we would just have some understanding? What would happen if we'd say, oh, it's okay, I'm gonna be all right. You know, what would happen if we developed a little patience? We're going to talk about that on Sunday, about the fruits of the Spirit. What would happen if we didn't allow offense to get the best of us? It's going to come. How you deal with it will determine where you go. Make sense? That's session two. Now you guys are going to have table talk. There's just a first few places in your book. Y'all don't have to go through the whole book because there's homework. Please do the homework. Do the homework. Everybody raise your right hand. Everybody raise your right hand. I do solemnly swear. swear. Put your hand back up. I do solemnly swear. In the name of Jesus, I'm going to do the homework because I'm going to grow and I'm going to be a disciple and I'm going to please God. In Jesus' name, name. don't you lie to God. (laughs) Table leaders, take it over. We love you. We'll see you tomorrow for those that can come. Otherwise, we'll see y'all Sunday. And uh, don't forget the homework. God bless you guys. (laughs) 